Hello, welcome back to The Living Process. My name is Greg Madison, and today I'm speaking with Barbara McGavin. Uh, Barbara is very well known in the UK and the international focusing community. Uh, she's been a focusing teacher since the late 80s. Uh, when I met her, I think in the very early 90s, and since uh, the mid 90s, she's been working closely with Anne Weiser Cornell, and together they develop Treasure Maps to the Soul, which is uh, a well-known training course um, for people in the focusing community and much beyond the focusing community. And they are now developing that work and calling it Untangling. There's a new book coming out in August, which we talk a little bit about. And we talk a little bit about the uh, distinction between different kinds of parts, how parts come about and how they change and the kinds of conditions that need to be in place for a part to find its stoppage and somehow get beyond that stoppage. Uh, I found it a really interesting conversation. I definitely would like to hear more about the specifics of parts. It left me with quite a few questions, uh, but also uh, Barbara said some really interesting things that uh, answered some things that I hadn't quite understood before. And I found that the time went very quickly, and um, I can feel now how many things we didn't get a chance to address that I would really love to go back to and talk to Barbara more about, and really look forward to the book. And there is a link in the show notes for their website for Anne and Barbara at Focusing Resources, where you can find out about upcoming trainings. Here it is. The Living Process with our guest, Barbara McGavin. Welcome back to The Living Process, and my guest this time is Barbara who is very well known in the focusing world. And I'm very pleased to be speaking with you. <laughs> Me too. Absolutely. We've known each other a long time now. Yeah. Just yeah. thinking about that. Yeah, very long and time. And it must, it must be almost 30 years. We must have met when we were nine. I, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Toddlers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'd like to start out actually just by asking how you found your way into the world of focusing and gentling and oh, everything that goes with it. Somehow you found it, and I'm curious about that. I I found it actually through my my first husband, hmm. and uh, he was a good shell therapist, and he had a friend who went to Canada. It was, um, went to Vancouver. Somehow she discovered focusing. And I actually don't know the story on that one, but she came back to England, which is where I was living with him. And she said to him that she met him. She said to him, you have to, you have to learn this basically. And I'm not going to tell you anything about it. Just go learn it. It will change your life. And that was it. I mean, it was not even trying to explain it because, of course, she knew that trying to explain focusing is like, you know, trying to explain to a centipede how to walk. And so that was in 1982, I think. 1981, 1982. And so at that point, um, I had just had a baby. And we went off to Canada to show off the baby and went to Toronto, which is where my parents uh, were living and where I grew up. And she, and, and we went to WH Smith and we were perusing the psychology book and we found this little book, you know, 
the little book with the, the stones on the cover and read it. And I read it and I went, wow, this is really fantastic. But I was also so jaded at that point because I had tried almost everything. I mean, you know, I had gone through the Gestalt. I'd gone through primal therapy. I'd gone through bioenergetics and all sorts of stuff. And I was so burnt out at that point. And I really thought, you know, nothing is really going to work. I mean, it, it was one of those, it's going to work for other people, but it's not going to work for me. Yes. And so I, I, I was kind of hope, hope, hoping that it was going to work. And, and it, we came back to England and it took us, I think, three to four months to find anybody who was willing to teach us. And so we finally found somebody. And I it took a while for it to kind of click with me. Like I, I kept trying and trying and trying. It was like six or eight, ten weeks into doing to learning, you know, once a week, having a two-hour class and stuff. And finally, something shifted. And I went, oh my God, this stuff really actually works. This is the, the holy grail of psychological processes. This is going to make a difference in my life. And I mean, I was really screwed up. I got it. I was a real messed up person. And I was really struggling with depression and even suicidal depression sometimes. And it was really, really tough. And things started to shift. I actually started to feel different. My ability to deal with stress changed. I mean, you know, the whole gamut of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's how it started was when we threw just one person saying to my then husband, go learn this thing, because it'll change your life. And wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um... I suspect it changed your life a lot more than you ever dreamed it would. <laughs> oh, God, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I never thought that it was going to turn into my profession. Yeah, exactly. Teaching women how to um, how to use computers at that point. So let me just ask a couple of questions. It, it sounds like when you came across focusing and you persevered to the point where it started to really click that it yeah. was a godsend for you it sounds like it was pivotal it it saved my life yeah exactly wow Basically. yeah and then something must have happened that you thought maybe you could teach it to other people or how did that come about <laughs> well my my then husband his name was beverly at that point and he changed his name to lee later but Bev and I, um, we would sit down at the at the kitchen table and we would talk about the focusing process mm. and we would analyze it and describe it for ourselves. And we came up with 13 steps at one point, which was kind of wild. But it was like, you know, we were really parsing out what all the little bits were. And we quite quickly uh, you know he was a therapist quite quickly we thought well you know maybe this i mean this stuff is really really good and people need to know about it so let's go and learn how to teach it and so our 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 teacher at that time was david karlovsky and we pushed him really hard to push Gene Gendlin, because that's who he learned it with, into being able to um, teach us to teach others. So we set up the first teacher's program uh, for focusing teachers in the UK. That was in 1983, beginning of 1983. And there were, I think, six people or something. And I think that Lee and I were the only one. 
that actually professionally taught folks from them. So I started in 83. Wow. It's, I mean, when you tell the story, it becomes so apparent to me that you, you weren't just, um, and I mean this with the utmost respect, you weren't just a person looking for her own salvation. You, once you got into it and realized that there was something to this, you then took that other step of actually, what is this? And it engaged you as more than just a tool for your own personal growth or self-help. It became something of interest to the point that you started already thinking, how could we share this? How could we share this? And what is this? What is this? Um, yeah. yeah. And and already starting to pull it apart and dissect it and put it back together and understand it and understand it, you know, more and more deeply. Mm -hmm. And and that, you know, that's never stopped. Good. I, I'm really curious about that, and I think we'll get to that um, <laughs> because I still have that question: What is this? Um, but I, I'm curious. I, th I think when I met you, you were co-leading a workshop in the UK. I'd come over from Ireland, right, and I yeah. suspect that was around 1990 or yeah, that must have been yeah, in the late 80s. That would have been because uh, Rob and I got together in um 88 i think it was. okay yeah 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 that's, that's... when we met rob for the first time yeah rob and peter Afford. Uh -huh. yeah. okay wow wow the old timers in the uk oh. community <laughs> <laughs> so maybe do you want to take us up to date a bit to kind of where your passion is at the moment okay uh, well, Anne and I have just finished writing a book it's called Untangling. Fantastic. And, um, uh, which is, which is brought together or, or distilled down the essence of, of the, the work that we've been doing, developing for the past 30 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's, how can I put it? The thing that we've found, the thing, the thing that's been like absolutely essential is what is it that makes really profound change possible? What is it that makes working with the stuff that just winds up, you know, you go to a certain place and then you just wind up in the same place all over again. You go, what the? Mm -hmm. And so we've been working with that and working with that like because it really matters. And we found that what makes the difference is not working to how can I put it, is creating the environment in which natural change occurs. So you don't fix it, mm -hmm. you don't work with it, so to speak. You create this container. I mean, we know that when what is missing fills itself in, change happens. Boom. Mm -hmm. It moves all on its own. You don't have to do anything. You just go, oh, wow, that's amazing. And so we call this container, the, the components of this container, so to speak, or the, it, we call it self and present. Mm -hmm. It is that quality of attention that makes a space in which this changes. And so we have now got five aspects of self and presence. We call it, and we call them powers just because that's kind of fun and funky. So there's the power of cultivating self, self and presence. And there are three aspects to that. And there's the power of and, which is about how can all these different parts have a space that it are held equally in equal regard with equal curiosity and care. And then there's the power of deep empathy, 
which is about if you are with one part, how can you be with it so that it can unfold itself, so that it can be fully heard, so that whatever you never got understood, never got accepted, never got um, even acknowledged, has an opportunity to be known in the way that it needs to be known. And then we have two more, which are about felt sensing. So half of, you know, two, three fifths of this um, self and presence thing is about relating with parts. And then we have the others, which is about felt sensing. Felt sensing that place, the one is called felt sensing the stoppage, which is actually experiencing directly how your body carries what got stopped. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, there's this stop place, this experience of stoppage, which was never fully experienced when it happened. It got, let's go mm -hmm. and not feel that. So there's a direct experiencing and a way of doing that as felt sensing. And then we also have felt sensing the whole thing, which is felt sensing the entire situation. We call them tangle. And a tangle is when it all got mucked up and everything that came after that getting stopped. So all of the strategies, all of the ways that people go around feeling something and coping with something if, if you don't have part of who you are available to be able to really engage. So that's what we're up to. And I've said a lot. So let me just, just say something back. Sure. Um, first of all, I want to just, for anyone who doesn't know you, and I don't, there may not be anyone, but if there is, <laughs> um, that you started uh, working with, with uh, Ann Weiser Cornell in around the mid nineties. Yeah. And you developed together the treasure maps to the soul work, which mm -hmm. a lot of people know. And now, and, and there is a lot kind of written on that and there's a, a lot yeah, of courses. Yeah. 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 And we've got, yeah. Yeah. And now what you're talking about is something that, that's a little bit more specific. It sounds like it's really about the tangles. Yeah. And if it, I is, it is just a continuation of the treasure maps yes. work. Okay. It, it's absolutely seamless. We just yeah. renamed it. So, <laughs> we just it. so untangling is the more updated title for it. That's right. The more okay. updated. Okay. More updated name. And I want to say back to you what you just described, but a little bit more generally, because okay, I can okay. hear that, um, as I've always found with you and Anne's work, that there's such specificity that is so helpful. So I'm not going to try to say all of that back because I don't have it <laughs> well enough to say it. Um, but it sounds to me that also what you're describing has a lot of familiarity to people that do focusing in whichever kind of way they might do it so it sounds like what you're emphasizing is self in presence which means if i've got you that the environment almost the atmosphere the whole situation that you create in focusing is um is pivotal if you don't yeah. have that right then nothing will come alive and begin to process itself. Yeah, what you'll do is you'll wind up relating to whatever's there from a part. Exactly. Which means you are going to try, you're not going to be able to hold it openly. Yeah. You're going to try and manipulate in some way. Exactly, and I've had years of that. I know that feeling. Because <laughs> it also doesn't feel very good while doing it it feels like you're focusing inside of a tightness in some yeah. way mm -hmm. 
But the other thing you said that sounded really interesting, because the, the presence that you're describing, I would sometimes teach that as a phenomenological attitude. Right. But the thing that you're adding in that also has to be there is it can't be an attitude of like an objective scientist. There has to be some some degree of care about what's yeah. happening. Yeah, some degree of heart in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the second thing that you were saying about the felt sensing, that sounded interesting. I wanted to just make sure I got it. Because it sounded like you were saying that there's there's almost two, um, two kinds of attention. This is the wrong way to say it, but I'll say it that way. Almost like two kinds of attention. One is the kind of attention where you're really close to the part where the tangle or the stuckness is and the other kind of attention sounded a little bit more holistic where you're not only paying attention to that place but you're paying attention to everything that has developed in order to manage it or cope with it over the years is that right um sort of okay um we there are two we say that there are kind of two different axes. There is a vertical axis and a horizontal axis. And the vertical axis goes deep and specific. Yeah. And the horizontal axis goes wide and inclusive. Yeah. And that's true for both parts. And we could call it um, direct record in terms of genes mm -hmm. kind of talking about, like, so. There is, with parts, you can go very wide. You can go, there's this part, and there's that part, and there's that part, and there's that part, and there's, oh, and there's that part too. And oh yeah, there's this part up here, and I'm including all of them. I am widening my awareness, my field of awareness to include every part that is that I can be aware of at this point in my tangle. Okay. Or you can go, deep, very deep with one part, like sensing what it's really not wanting to have happen to me, and not wanting to have happen if that happens, mm -hmm. and so on and so on, until you get to, like, to the really deepest place, in the, and it goes, finally, you heard me, you really got me. So there's that yeah. deep access as well. Yeah. And then it's also true with the point of stoppage. The point of stoppage is actually a deep, specific place so you, that's the vertical axis of that and then you have this horizontal axis which is getting a felt sense of the whole thing which means the whole thing including everybody else in the world that's involved mm -hmm. with this mm -hmm. and what my home is like and you know and mm -hmm. everything that could be involved with this particular tangle so that's this you felt sense of the whole thing but it's Again, this horizontal, so this vertical and horizontal axis throughout the whole of our methodology. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, that, that makes immediate intuitive sense to me. Um, but you also said something that I wanted to ask about. It sounds like you're making a distinction between a part and a felt sense or a direct referent? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, okay. Um, a part... A part is a kind of repetitive... It's a repetitive strategy. It's something that we have developed as a way of not dealing with something, but also dealing with something else. We still have to live our lives, and we have to live our lives as best we can, but a part is partialized. It's it's not got full access to our our self as all of us. It's mm -hmm. it's a way of dealing with specific situations so that we can avoid feeling certain things. And it's repetitive, you know. You know, it's this. You do the same kind of thing over and over and over again, in the same kind of way, 
and it winds up building up layers because also parts, because they can only deal with a part of a situation, there is also an element of failure over and over again, which then has layers of shame, has mm -hmm. layers of blank failure, it has layers of defensiveness. It, you know, so, but that parts are these kind of psychological, you know, um, they're all of the, all of the psychologists have names for this stuff. Yeah. And, um, and we just call them parts. We do have three different parts, three different kinds of parts, but we can go into that in a little while. Okay. And then there is the, what Jenlin would call a direct reference, which is how the body carries it. And you can sense that directly in your body and you can symbolize that directly. And when you symbolize it accurately, it'll shift. So there's these two things and they have, we have different kinds of ways of approaching them because parts need relationship. Mm -hmm. Felt senses don't actually need relationship. They need attention, but they don't need the same kind of relational contact. That's what we found. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so a part, the way you're describing a part, it sounds clear to me that it has an affective or a kind of emotional component. Yeah. It has emotional, psychological, intellectual even. Yeah. There are kinds of parts of, that ha are very intellectual. Yeah. But also, if you attend to a part, it can develop a felt sense? There, well, you can have a felt sense about it. Okay. Um, Maybe if we use an example, because I'm thinking of, for example, a self-critical process where I have a part of myself that says I'm not good enough in some way, and I live with the impact of that. We would say there are two parts. Yes. So those are two parts. Two different parts. Yeah. There's the one that's being critical, and there's the one that's feeling criticized. Yes. But would you also then look for the feeling associated with each part? Um, I would turn towards each part, and mm -hmm. I would first establish relationship. I would first yeah. go, ah, oh, yeah, okay, I know you're there. And I can sense there's something going on for you. So I'm saying, I'm here, I'm here to listen, I'm here to be with you, I'm here to really get how, how it is for you, however that is. And the ones that are critical often kind of hover over here, mm -hmm. and they have um, opinions about. And I know that anything that has any part of me has an opinion about another part or other people or whatever is anxious. I can hmm. take that to the bank. Yeah. So I know that it's worried about something. Mm -hmm. And so I can offer it empathy already for its being worried. I can say, hmm, I'm sensing that maybe you're worried about something here. Um, you're not wanting something to happen to me unless you, know, you you step in and try and take care of things here. I know that no matter how critical it is, it's always worried and mm -hmm. it's always trying to save my life. Yeah. I just, that's like the baseline for me is, so on, I know that I am also not the target. Actually, I'm not the target. It just doesn't trust that I can cope with life. So it's having to, Mm -hmm. take care of things mm -hmm. okay so and so we have this the the deep empathy process in order to be able to really help it 
to articulate what it has not yet been able to fully articulate. So and as it goes through that process, it starts to relax. It starts to believe that I'm around so that mm -hmm. it doesn't have to step in and direct everything. Mm -hmm. And so it can, I, I used to be absolutely plagued, you know, 24 seven basically by these guys. I don't remember the last time one of them turned up. Wow. I mean, it's really like they just don't do that anymore. They don't need to. And if there's any kind of flicker of anxiety, I know that it's saying it's not even really a part. It's now I'm realizing, I'm mm -hmm. noticing that there's something in my life that needs some attention. Mm -hmm. but that's it. It doesn't do this critical thinking. Yeah, that's interesting. It does sound as though um, it's bodily present in some way. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Often this one doesn't show up very strongly in the body, except yeah. you start noticing. I started noticing that, oh, it's actually anxious. Mm -hmm. So anxiety in the body is, is kind of the feeling that goes yeah. with this one. Yeah. Or panic. Yeah, okay. panic. Yeah. 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 And you made this, again, this interesting distinction between the part and I. Yes, absolutely. So what, what, what is the I? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, no difficult questions are being asked <laughs> on this podcast, correct? <laughs> um, the I. Um, For me, it's, I am the one who turns towards. Yeah. I am the one who listens. Mm -hmm. I am the one who makes a space. Mm -hmm. I am the one who contains all these other parts. Mm -hmm. and, and I am here in the world. I am the one who takes action. When, yeah. when I'm clear, when I'm not heartsy, I am the one who acts. I mean, there are parts that can act, and that's another matter. However, it really, what we're wanting to do in this work is to empower self, mm -hmm. to be able to, like, I am the one who's talking to you right now. It ain't okay. my part. I'm mm -hmm. the one who's here, which is really nice mm -hmm. and a lot of fun. And I'm the one who is, who, interacts spontaneously in the situation in which I find myself. So. so let me say some of that back to you. Okay, great. Here's something <laughs> um, that sent you back. I because it it it, uh, it raises a question for me and I know it's a difficult question and I I ask a lot of people this question only only because I'm curious for the or something that's like an answer to me um and everyone gives me something that is in that direction um so for you the i is not a part no. the i is the space and the attention or awareness that can turn towards a part and welcome it and in it's fact, really welcome good. all parts. Yeah. I is one of the capacities of I. Yes. Yeah. And you also said that the I is what usually, you made a modification, but usually what acts in the world. I'm not even sure. It depends. I think it's from person to person how partsy okay. they are. Okay. How usually it is. <laughs> how partsy they are. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah interesting when i it, so when you are self in presence um i'm taking that to mean that's when you are in your larger i yeah okay that's when it. you're yeah when you're in that um 
state of being, if I can say it that way. Yeah, that's a pretty good way. Okay. When you're in that state of being, um, and now this, I don't know exactly how to say, but something like, are you, do you sense yourself as uh, a separate being in some way, or do you, does your, um, definition as a separate person feel less clear? I didn't understand that question. You're going to have to do that one again. Uh, 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 let me let me ask ask it in a different way. Okay, great. When when I am in that state of being, when I feel um, in that more expansive self where I can attend to the parts of me and where I can um, focus on a felt sense or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> when I'm in that state, that larger state, I actually feel expansive. Yes. You know, physically, my body feels much more open and expansive. Yes. And the distinction between me and the world around me, um, it feels like I dissipate into the world and the, it's not such a clear distinction between what is me and what is not me when i'm in that state of awareness and i guess that's what i'm wondering if if this if the i or the self in presence is comes from the individual or the individual accesses something that is more than the individual And it's a difficult question. Oh, yeah, it's a beautiful question. Uh, lovely. Both. Yeah. I feel both more clearly differentiated. Like that my my boundary is actually clearer mm -hmm. than when I'm part C. Yeah. And at the same time, I also feel more I don't know how to even say it. Lovely. Um yeah, less less divided from in yeah. some way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that is a lovely way to say it. Let me just say that back. That when you're in that state of being, that self, self in presence, that state of I, whatever you want to call it, um, it is clearer to you what is me and not me, and at the same time, it's. How did you say the second part? Yeah, it's uh. I am I don't know how to say it. it you know, it's probably why you can't say it back. Is uh it's like I look around and I am more I am more able to experience the mm -hmm. world directly. Yes. That. Okay. So let me try it that way. That it's more clear what is me and not me. And I am more able to experience the world directly. Yeah. So yeah. the interaction between me and the world is is transparent. Yeah, transparent, almost kind of, I want to say flowing. That's not quite the right word, oh, yeah. but something like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting because those are two things that sound almost like they're incompatible, and yet they are both uh, there necessary yeah yeah like, i really need to have me mm -hmm. in order to be able to really interact yeah openly yeah yeah i i really like that because the way i say it i often don't say that part of it and yet as soon as you say it i realize oh, of course that's very true if i'm you know living in the world from a part 
<clears throat> I'm much more likely to not know my boundaries and sort of not know what's me and not me. Mm -hmm. So when I'm in that state of presence, that is so much more clearly there, but in a way that is so open and transparent. It's not like a, it's not like a, some a kind barrier. of a, a barrier, exactly. It's not a barrier. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it kind of fits into or fits with the whole Jindalinian, you know, body, what body. And, you know, the, my body is actually as large as my experiential body, which includes a lot. Yeah. 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 And so, although, and it's it's wonderful, this paradox of, you know, I, I really do have a skin envelope. I can touch that, you know. I know that this is, you know, my, my skin envelope body. Mm -hmm. And I also have an experimental body, which, you know, is as big as this house, perhaps like mm -hmm. bigger than the house. Mm -hmm. And includes everything that is in there. Yeah. In yeah. some way, in some experiential way. Yes, exactly. But, yeah. Which is all kind of cool. Yeah. Um, and you had said that there were different kinds of parts. Mm. Yeah. This one, you know, the critical one, the one that comes up being critical, it tends to hover over the right. I mean, we find 98% or over the right shoulder. Anyway, those ones, we actually have a name. We call them protectors. They have opinions about the world and you and everything else mm -hmm. and they try to direct things they try to control through their the way they influence and they can influence in a number of ways and one of them is kind of verbal one of them is telling you what to do and one of them is by actually constricting your body they can con they can act on your body by you now constricting your breathing you know giving you stomach aches headaches all of that kind of stuff and it's all in terms of control because they're anxious mm -hmm. they don't trust you to be able to deal with your life so they're protectors one time and they cannot act in the world which is really kind of i remember when i discovered this mm -hmm. if they could act in the world they'd be bloody well doing it mm -hmm. they don't mm -hmm. so all they can do is control. Okay, that's one type. Then we have another type, the one that gets criticized, that gets told what to do. Yeah. And it can act in the world. And it can either resist or it can capitulate. But basically, it's, or it can just collapse. So, which is a kind of resistance. So, but it can it can act, and we call them defenders. And they are defending against criticism. They are defending against other people being critical, because other people are critical and they have their parts and they do things too. But they so this one is the one that um has been known to eat pints of ice cream in one go. They are the ones that that do the addictive behavior. Mm -hmm. They are the ones that ref, you know, procrastinate forever. They are, so they are the ones that actually are part C, but can do stuff in the world. And we call them defenders. And then we have one more part, which we call a small one. And a small one, our theory is that a small one forms when trauma occurs and carries unfelt, unlived pain. And it needs, it needs the kind of care that it did not receive at the time in order to heal. So the defenders are trying to take care of the small ones, trying to soothe them, trying to do whatever the small one can't do trying to both push away from it because it hurts and also suppress it and care for it 
but does a whole bunch of stuff to Hendry's work so far. And so there's these three different types of parts. And from self and presence, we are with them in somewhat different ways. With the uh, protectors need to have their fears and their dreams for you really heard. The so do defenders. They need to have their feelings about what it's like to be carrying difficult, difficult kind of I've got to take care of this baby and this baby is screaming all the time and I don't know what to do with it and I've got to go out there and earn a living and you know it's it's a real hard hard job for a defender and so really being able to get how it is for them they you know they've been reviled or poor these guys have been reviled too you know so lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of empathy for all of these parts as and they're they're quite different. You've yeah, yeah. That <clears throat> um, as you describe that, I I want to check this with you because I find myself um, kind of, I, I I find myself questioning how do these parts come about. And I'm curious, I'm curious what you've found. Yeah. Um, something, we can say something happens. Yeah. In somebody's life. Yeah. And it's not so much what happens as what happens next or doesn't happen next that really makes the difference. Really bad things can happen, but if you have, if you have the kind of support you need to live through it, then it's not a trauma. Yeah. <clears throat> it's just something bad that happens. And you, you can, it can even be a source of growth, you know, called traumatic growth. But that really depends on the environment in which this occurs. Both, do I have the resources inside myself or do I have the resources in the people who are around me? Or, you know, if something bad happens and then you're basically told, shut up, you know, just suck it up, get on with it. It's not important. That's one kind of way in which that gets stopped. Mm -hmm. There is some kind of process that needs to occur that gets stopped yeah and when it gets stopped you have to do something you have to it gets carried in your body as something which does not have a next step it has an implied next step but the mm -hmm. next step is not happening mm -hmm. so and then you have to do so you have to do something and so art you cannot go forward with, with all of you there Part of you has to go forward. And it comes up with strategies, how to make sure that you don't feel bad and deal with what's going on. Yeah. So it's a, a split thing that happens there. So that's kind of gives you an idea. And it, I mean, even worse, you can have trauma on trauma because you can have, I can't go forward there. And then you get whacked, you know, really quite literally. You know, a lot of people who get any time they express something in that area, they get mm -hmm. the, they get attacked. They get attacked verbally, yeah. physically. Yeah. And I'm thinking and adds layers. Yeah. And I'm thinking also when you describe that of how a person does that to themselves sometimes. Absolutely. Because yeah. it's it's that's what partly what protectors are about they say mm -hmm. i am going to criticize you so hard so you don't go there yeah exactly yeah and so, it's you know it's better than what i'm doing to you is not as bad as what would happen if you go out there and, and do any of this stuff that mm -hmm. i think is about good so by focusing as you were saying earlier on by focusing on the the stoppage 
you're you're going right to what is the core of what maybe could have happened so that this bad event wasn't a trauma but for whatever reason didn't happen yeah so that that can finally as you say kind of untangle itself and begin to carry itself forward yeah yeah and that and one of the things that really amazes me about this work is how when that happens you cannot predict from inside the tangle, what it's going to look like, what how you're going to hold. Mm -hmm. you, you cannot. Mm -hmm. You will have ideas about what it's going to be like, but mm. those are all generated from inside the tangle. Yes. So, yeah. 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 I am living so differently from what I thought would yeah. be an untangled. I mean, I'm I'm a mouthy person. <laughs> <laughs> and when you first met me i was like a really i was a quiet little mouse right yeah you know, you were was, you were quiet yeah soft I quiet. yeah i was very quiet I'm very yeah. Soft. yeah yeah to the point of vanishing just about okay i don't vanish anymore i'm just Yeah, that's interesting because I think I, I'm also thinking a little bit of working with clients yeah. and how clients can have an assumption yeah. that if they get over whatever the trouble is, they can go back and live as well as they did before they had any trouble. Uh -huh. Instead of what I think you're saying is, well, actually, the trouble is implying a new way of living. That's right. You're not you're not going to go back. You're going to go forward yeah. in a way that you've never lived before. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. One of the things that um, is really cool, I think, about parts mm -hmm. is that parts do learn stuff. They mm -hmm. do yeah. actually develop mm -hmm. in lots of different ways. Yeah. And when a tangle untangles, all of that you get to keep. You don't lose anything. So all of the capacity, all of the, the smart things that you've learned and developed, they're yours, but in a totally different way. Mm -hmm. They're not like narrow and just yeah. for very specific situations. They they become sort of life-wide. So all of that elaboration is implicitly there and comes out when yeah. needed it's yeah, not explicitly yeah there. yeah, yeah okay. exactly it's all yours yeah oh that sounds exciting <laughs> it is it is fun it's really really fun yeah can i ask what um of this work which i know is a continuation of work that you and you and Anne have been doing for you know years now yeah um of this work, what currently feels like kind of the most exciting part of it or your biggest sort of passion in the work? Hmm. Gosh. Um, the, the leading edge for me. Yeah is probably about relationships because most of the work has been sort of intra psychological it's been about what's going on inside of individual people mm -hmm. but it's it really is it fascinates me how how parts book each other. So, like, what is it? You know, if somebody's partsy, mm -hmm. just noticing how that that is. It's really hard not to get booked, get caught by their part and get into the, you know, their their, um, an embodiment of a protector, and then I wind up 
reacting to them from a place of being independent. Yeah, that that I mean, there's kind of a a well known phrase in focusing that parts create each other. But I think what you're saying is that parts can create each other in different people. That's right. Yeah. For they they um, elicit. You yeah. Know? But if I'm really self in presence, they yes. can be as protectorate as they want and it's just not going to go anywhere for me exactly like, i can be curious yeah i can go oh yeah so it's something really something's going on for you something's upsetting yeah. you yeah and i'm really i'm and i'm interested in all of that what happens between people yeah that is very interesting um because what you said about being self in presence, you added in that thing that was so important that it's more clear what's me and what's not me. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So the other person relating to me from a part, it's clearly not me. And I don't need to activate one of my parts to respond. That's right. Because yeah. it's not about me. Yeah. It's much harder to be gaslit. Yeah. When you're self in presence. Yeah. 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 I'm not buying it. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. It makes me wonder if in this contemporary world, so many of us end up living in a parts way. Oh, yeah. I see it all over the place. Yeah. And, um, you doing the work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah it immediately makes me wonder if there's a way of um a broader way of kind of bringing some of this awareness to ordinary citizens of the world yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well um, the book is coming out in, in August. Right. So, and we have written it very specifically for not just focusing people, but okay. it's, it um, tried to be a book that could be read by anybody. Terrific. Yeah. Yeah, good. I'm really glad to hear that. Um, and you and Anne are offering workshops? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. We've okay. got uh, the we've got a couple of retreats coming up. One of them in Germany, and should have brought the dates with me. Uh, but you can find them on the website. I'll put a link to the website. Focusonresources.com. Yeah. Uh, and one in Colorado. So okay. actually, there's two in both of them. It's, it's two weeks. A, a fundamental course we call them the fundamentals now and an advanced course back to back okay. it's called getting free it's a year-long course okay. that um takes people all the way through all five of the powers and and supports them in various ways and that's starting in march March, yeah and is that online it's online yeah yeah okay um, 24 sessions and it's they're both both of them are for people who have done the basic focusing course so you need to, do okay. need to know focusing partnership to okay. be able to join those okay was when you work as a focusing guide and focusing teacher and you work one-on-one -on -one with someone kind of ongoing maybe yeah, yeah. um just where the distinction if there is one um kind of is drawn between that and an ongoing therapeutic relationship yeah. do you see a distinction there yeah i do okay um i don't see myself as a therapist yeah i see myself as a as a facilitator of um of an untangling process which mm -hmm. is wildly therapeutic yes but it's, yeah. um 
but it's not based within a particular therapy um, framework, except mm -hmm. what we developed together. Um, but people, in in what I what I do with people, they they are in charge of when, how often, they come, they go. I I've been working with one person for over twenty years, and she comes and she goes whenever she wants to have a focusing session with me. Mm -hmm. She got she books one in, and then I don't see her for like three months. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's very different from a kind of ongoing in-depth therapy relationship. People know that I am, I'm not here all the time. Mm -hmm. I go back and forth between the UK and here, which is California. And, and I am not available for weeks at a time. And so that would be really disruptive mm -hmm. for a therapeutic relationship. And people know that they know that up front mm -hmm. that you know and it's also when people book with me there might not be a, an available session this week and there might not be one next week i don't have anything that's set aside for particular people there are people who book ahead a long ways because they do want to be with me mm -hmm. every week mm -hmm. but it's up to them. Yeah. Absolutely. It, we have a different kind of contract. Yes. Um, I like that distinction between therapy and therapeutic because there's many things in the world that are therapeutic that are not therapy. Yeah. And there could be many therapy relationships that are not therapeutic. That's true, too. Um, but... <laughs> Um, I suspect with like I now work completely online and yeah. I am a little bit more actually probably quite a bit more sort of flexible in terms of frequency of sessions and that sort of thing right. so I'm thinking that in some ways some of the distinctions you've just named may not be as much distinctions all the time yeah um, but especially when you talk about your interest in sort of the uh how one person's part can create another person's part i'm thinking that does that ever come up in sessions when you're yeah yes because yes. yes. <laughs> in therapy it certainly does oh, yes. yeah <laughs> there are times when i need to spend some time afterwards and there's also sometimes when I need to kind of yeah. acknowledge that there is a part of me that is starting to get triggered yeah. by what's going on with them. Particularly, you know, if people have really strong protector parts that mm -hmm. are being really super critical of the person that's there. Yeah. Yeah. It can be really something to to be able to hold that part of me that wants to get in there and mm -hmm. fix that part, mm -hmm. change mm -hmm. that part, challenge that part, tell that part, stop doing that. That's not nice. You shouldn't really do that to that person. Yeah. So, and so I know that there is, you know, it, it can sometimes be, you know, even gut wrenchingly difficult yeah. to be with somebody who is really, um, identified we call it being identified with a um a critical part part that's criticizing them yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's i mean that's very familiar to me and it's there's there's distinctions and yet there is some overlap i guess between the professions yeah i would say this yeah probably quite a lot of them yeah uh, sometimes at least yeah sometimes at least yeah. So is there anything we didn't, I mean, the, the time's gone very quickly. Is there anything we didn't touch on that you would really love to say something about? I think we've really said a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
it's I, and it's been it's lovely hanging out with you, having a deep conversation, and I get to say all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm just really good. I can feel in myself um, a lot of what you've said is familiar to me, but um, also some of what you've said feels like, ooh, that's, there's a new edge there. Something's being cultivated that I haven't heard before, and uh, I can feel excitement about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. So thank you very much and definitely look forward to the book in August. Yeah. And I'll put links so that people can find your work. Yeah. Good. Yeah. It's been um, it's been a pleasure talking to you all the way over there in California. Yeah. You in Brighton. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be back in the UK. Good. Yeah. Good. Good. Nice to have you back over here for a little bit. All right, my dear. Okay, thank you Love very, you. very much. Yeah, and you. Thank Have you. a good day. Yeah, bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye for now. <laughs>